Tucker's a big figure, but Elon Musk is a bigger figure. He's really too big to ignore. He's too important to ignore. He's done some extremely impressive uh, and innovative things, but he is also very, very, very dangerous. Hello and welcome to the Bullard Podcast. I am your host, Tim Miller, coming at you live from the Sears Roebuck Studio here in Los Angeles, photo studio, where I got my childhood pictures taken. I'm with Don Lemon. He's in his living room. It's a little warm there, it sounds like. How are you doing, Don? There's some dogs. <laughs> I'm great. It's a little warm. You have to open the window. Maybe I should turn the fireplace off. Can we tell everyone this has been like a comedy of errors, like... I can't get into the thing, the microphone, the computer, the it's headphones, a, the The dogs. post cable life is a little different. I'm just, I'm wondering, <laughs> there's some downsides, right? You don't have a team there kind of, you know, doing your mic for you, but also maybe your synapses are firing in your brain. Like, you know, as maybe, do you feel like you're seeing the world in technicolor now? There are pros and cons, right? To be an off the cable grind. Uh, I, I love it. Well, yeah, I guess mostly pros. Um, I get to do what I want to do. I get to choose the content I choose. I get to talk about what I want to talk about. I get to lean into what candidate I feel I'm feeling excited about. I get to, uh, I get to be more transparent. So it's mostly pros. Yeah. I mean, did you feel like I was, I was thinking, and you're doing what three hours every day on the morning when you move to the morning? Uh, two when I three? moved to the morning, yeah, but that was a yeah. short, yeah, that was a no, short, short. I mean, that was but even still. six to nine. And then I did, yeah, but I did two hours a night at least for eight years on CNN. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Eventually your brain had to be like, no, uh, uh-uh. uh, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not working at a hundred percent. This is your, this is uh cable. This is your brain on cable. Is that <laughs> yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was a lot. Okay. I've got a theme for the show. Um, I want to talk about Elon, and it's within the theme. And the theme is, how are we supposed to, how are people in the media that care about truth, like you, um, supposed to deal with MAGA politicians, how, how, uh, MAGA and MAGA platforms? Uh, we got the, you have the Don Lemon show, it was on X for a minute, it's still on X, but you're also on YouTube, on you're on iHeart. Yeah. Um, how do we reach MAGA voters? How do you deal with MAGA politicians? And and I I, so I think a lot of times progressive, you know, commenters uh, think that this is a lot easier question than it is. Like, don't platform them. But it's it's actually kind of a complicated question. And well, I, I want to start with Rana, but I'm I'm curious what your biggest picture's thoughts are on that before we get to Rana. Oh, you mean what happens with the MAGA folks? Yeah. How do you do? You, how, how what are well, we supposed to do with them? Well, I always had this policy that, you know, I didn't like to give a platform to people who were liars or insurrectionists or, um, you know, who are just apologists. Um, and that didn't really offer any, um, insight or didn't educate the viewer at all. That was my policy, especially when I was at night and for most of my years, uh, at CNN. I do think that you have to hear from, I hate to say all sides, right? I don't believe in like fake balance. Again, I don't believe in all sides matter. On. Yeah, all sides matter. I don't believe in putting people on who are liars, basically, and who are election deniers. Um, but you do have to hear from, you know, Republicans and Democrats. I am I am an independent. I'm not a registered, you know, I'm not registered to vote I'm, you know, under any political party. So I do think that you it's I think it's a sort of a case by case basis. But when it comes to MAGA, that's a whole we're in a whole different um, territory now, Tim. And yeah. I think we have to be careful about who we put on the air because people come on the air just in order to lie. And that that is a new phenomenon within the Trump era. Yeah, I want to dig into that a little more. Let's start with Rana. So NBC hires Rana. Everybody knows about this Rana Romney. Romney um, was her name right before she changed it um, for to make Donald Trump happy. Uh, and uh, there was, I mean, kind of an unprecedented backlash among the on-air talent um i hate the word talent but among the you know on-air journalists uh, for nbc i want to play one clip that really s- struck me uh from rachel maddow last night let's listen to that okay if you care what i think about this i will tell you the fact that ms mcdaniel is on the payroll at nbc news to me that is inexplicable i mean you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't hire a like a, a wise guy you wouldn't hire a made man like a mobster to work at a DA's office, right? <laughs> you you wouldn't hire a pickpocket to work as a TSA screener. And so I, I find the decision to put her on the payroll ex- inexplicable. And I, and I hope they will reverse their decision. And it's not about, you know, 
Democratic Party, Republican Party. It's not about partisanship. It's not about right versus left. It's not about being a political professional versus some other kinds of person. It's not about being mean or nice to journalists. It's not about just being associated with Donald Trump and his time in the Republican Party. It's not even about lying or not lying. It's about our system of government and undermining elections and going after democracy as an ongoing project. What do you think about that? Um, I watched it live and I think it was an amazing commentary. And it was Quite frankly, I kept thinking if I was in cable news, this is something that I would do. There are very few people who have the balls to do what she did and to stand up to management. And um, most people just want to, you know, I, hey, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to rock the boat. I have this big paycheck. You know, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to. I'm afraid of not getting access to certain people. I'm afraid that people are going to think that I'm partisan. Um, there's a lot of that going on all over, not just in cable, but in broadcast as well. And I'm sure probably in print or what have you. But uh, I was bravo to Rachel Maddow because she spoke the truth and she did it in a way that made people understand the dangers of and I hate that word platforming, but the dangers of elevating and giving amplifying is a better word, amplifying the voice of someone who is really a pathological liar, someone who has encouraged and supported someone who inspired uh, an insurrection someone who went along with a fake elector scheme, someone who was part of um, trying to overthrow the will of the people for of a free and fair election. So what I thought of that, I thought it was right on. And I kept thinking, quite honestly, Tim, who, what head will be first to roll at, at NBC for making that hire? Um, they can hire who they want. It's their ball field. They can, but Seems I like Ron might was, be the first head to roll. <laughs> Well, I mean, I meant in management because someone yeah. had to make the decision. I mean, look, if someone offered you a ton of money to become a contributor, would you say no? Yeah. I'm no. just saying it's not Ronna McDaniel's fault. Ronna McDaniel's is who, who she is, but as I just pointed out. But I mean, what was her role there? She was just a living, breathing example of an insult to all the journalists at NBC and MSNBC. Yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty boss move by Rachel. She's like, I'm just going to work one night, and then I'm going to spend half of my one night this week making fun of my bosses. Uh, I do have to give us credit <laughs> for that. Um, uh, okay, uh, making fun is me wrong. Attacking my bosses. Yeah, uh, I, don't judgment. She, I don't think she attacked yeah, them. Attacking their judgment, just, criticizing their judgment. She, well, she held up a mirror. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think she attacked them. I think that look. I think that she was very kind to um, Rashida Jones and she said, you know, she believes that Rashida made the right decision eventually. I'm not sure about it first that like the first part she said, yeah. you know, after there was outrage among the ranks, Rashida made the right decision, which was great. I, I commend Rashida for that. And then she said, you know, if you are, um, it takes a big person to realize that they make made a mistake in reverse course. And so I think she was saying, Rashida did it. You guys should do it. And you guys can do it. So I don't think she was insulting them. She was trying to appeal to their better angels. Yeah. It's worth mentioning. It wasn't just Rachel. It was my fellow former Republican Scarborough and Nicole Wallace also had similar commentaries. Rachel's was just the most pointed. Um, I, here's mm -hmm. the thing, though. Rana, and Chuck Todd. And Chuck Todd, yeah. Uh, Rana, um, Rana's kind of an easy call. Because she was among the most shameless liars when it comes to the you know the election denialism and and apologists for Donald Trump, but here's the problem, Don. Like, okay, so if you're a news network, we can take it out from cable, just anything. If you're a news organization of any kind, any platform, and one party has become a, you know completely enthralled to a pathological liar who tried to overturn the government, and everybody supports them at some level in that party. But that's one of the two major parties in our system. I, I, what do you do? Like, where is the line? I, you know, do you have Mike Lee on your network? I, Mike, Mike Johnson is the Speaker of the House now. He was, he was part of the effort to overturn the election. Uh, you know, like, where, like, why is Rana? How do you, how do you deal with these people? Well, um, here's, it's, as I said, it's a case by case basis because Mike Lee is a Speaker of the House. So you want to hear from the Speaker Mike of the House. Mike Johnson. But in is. that, Mike Johnson, I give you two he, mics, yeah. yeah, Mike Johnson is a speaker of the house and you want to hear from him and you want to hear from people who have roles in the government. You have to do that, but you have to fact check them in real time or you tape them and then offer your viewer. You tell them or whomever are your listener. This is the truth. They were lying about this. Um, but Ronna McDaniel is not even popular among the MAGA folks, even though she helped okay. him out. I mean, she's not even popular among Republicans. 
Like she's kind of on the outs of the party. She just, she got out it. Like Donald Trump said, no more. I'm going to put someone else in. So that's why I don't really understand that decision. It's not a tough decision when it comes to Ronna McDaniel. But when it comes to other people, you don't have to put people on who are, um, you, you know, you don't have to put the Matt Gates of the world on. I'm sorry. Um, you can talk about people. You can talk about folks. You can talk about their policies. You can try to under, you can explain um, what they're doing, but you do not have to put them on if they're only going to come on and hijack the, the broadcast or whatever it is that you're, you're doing and lie to people. It doesn't look. It's very simple. You're offering a service. And if people aren't getting anything from that service, then why do it? You know, I, I came to buy a cake and you're trying to sell me a pizza. That's not, you know, that's not what you do. But and also what I would tell people all the time when they came on and they tried to lie and they, they wouldn't, you know, pay attention or, you know, they tried to hijack the show is that it is not a right for you to appear on any network, on this network that I'm on. It is a privilege for you to get to speak directly to the American people and so many of the American people. And so if you're going to come on and if you if you want to have that privilege, then you have to respect the people and not lie to them. And you have to respect the network and you have to respect me. Otherwise, I don't have to have you on. Do you um, do you worry, though? I hear I totally agree with everything you said. I just wonder how you think about the echo chamber problem of it all. I mean, sometimes I feel like it is you know, back. Yeah. Not when I'm like. Not, not as much anymore. Like back in 2016, it made sense. Like I just worked for Jeb, yeah. you know, networks would have me on. It'd be like, hey, you'll have an Obama person and a former Jeb person and we'll argue and sometimes we'll agree on things, sometimes we'll disagree. That made sense, right? But I feel like then that continued into the Trump era where people would be like, hey, we'll have Jen Psaki and Tim Miller on. And it's like, me and Jen agree on almost that. I mean, like we don't <laughs> agree on the tax cuts, right? But like we, like on the core question about the, the guy that was the president at that time and now is running for president again, we agree. And so don't you need to represent the view of the of MAGA world that like if you're if you're in political news like don't you need to represent their view at some degree and not just have never it, trumpers be the token you know, yes, whatever of course I, I don't think you're hearing what I'm saying you can have people who represent the MAGA party but the, but they, are there anybody people is yeah. there anybody that represents them that doesn't lie? Now, now we're in the Mobius strip. You know, now this is the question: Is who is that? Who is that? Oh. Who represents the MAGA Ooh. party that is not a liar? That's the question. That's well, it's hard. That's really tough. I mean, you know, can you have Kellyanne of, Conway on? <laughs> can you have Sarah Sanders? Can I you mean, have Kaylee McEnany? Right? It's like I, I mean, okay. It's just who very you- interesting because you know. Kelly and Conway, I remember being on when she actually made the switch from uh, Ted Cruz to Donald Trump. And I was like, hey, wow, I don't get that. I mean, it was like oh, yeah. like a light switch. I know. We were um, in the green. I happened to one green room, I think. I was there. I was like, it, she it just did. got, a phone, it, it, she well, got you, a phone call and changed her mind. Yeah, I, I remember argued reading in the, the green room. Yeah, I remember reading the blue cards and it said, you know, um, Kelly and Conway, Donald Trump advisor, Trump advisor. And I said, to my producers, I said, hey, guys, are you listening in the control room? We need to fix Kellyanne's blue card because uh, it says Trump, but she's a, you know, she's a super PAC or whatever thing for Ted Cruz. Cruz. And then she looked over at me. She goes, no, that's right. And I went, now you're for Trump? She goes, yes. And I went, God, I don't really understand this whole <laughs> politics thing. Like, it went overnight. Uh, Kaylee McEnany was someone that we put on. She, they needed someone on a show called Get to the Point, which eventually became my staff. They were doing a test show on the network and it was called get to the point. They needed like someone who was anti-Trump or Republican who was cute and blonde or whatever. And so they put her on and then she was sort of, she came on, I think as an anti-Trump. And then I, she realized like being pro Trump got her more, you know, recognition. And so then she became pro Trump, but it's, it's interesting how people sort of with no resumes made their resumes and then moved to the front of the line. The yeah. Trump in the Trump era. Okay. So we've we've navigated this first hard question, <laughs> which is we don't know what to do. We 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 you, both you agree that we should have the MAGA folks re- represented, but we don't know. Maybe we should get a MAGA AI. It's one to, of those. It's one of them. those. I don't know. It's one of those things you know it when you see it, right? Yeah. You know when someone's like, well, they say you. I don't know. I can't really give you the definition of pornography, but I know it when I see it. Yeah. I can't really give you the definition of who. Um, you should have on, but you know it when you see it. You know it when at least people are trying to be practical and they're t- trying to tell the truth. No one is going to – look, people are going to – it's politics, right? Right. They're going to lie to you or I shouldn't say they're going to lie to you, but they're going to you know, embellish. They're going to have their talking points. 
that's all normal stuff. But if people like come on and they flat out lie, I think you need to change your, you know. All right. So there is, um, there's a supply side of this and the demand. Okay. Now it's like, okay. So the first question is how to deal with the politicians. Now it's like, okay, how do you reach the people, the voters that are driving all this? How do you reach the mega people? And I saw an interesting stat yesterday of the, you know, how people are always like, oh, Trump has some problems within the Republican Party. It's being showed in the Haley vote in the primary. The most, there was a poll yesterday or a couple of days ago, and it asked, you know, Republican voters whether they're happy with Trump being the leader of the party. And it also asked what kind of media they consume. And among people that only consume MAGA media, 100% were happy with Trump. Among the people that also consume other media, it was like 70%, right? So, it's you know, you can see just how much of it is a media. Yeah, I mean, some of this is chicken and egg, but um, but how much of the, the media drives this. So, I kind of, you, how, do you have, to, I mean, it seems to me like your effort to do an X and to get with Elon, I've listened to some of your other interviews, was like some attempt to break that bubble. Uh, is that right? I, I, what are your thoughts yes. on how to, before we get into the details of the Elon interview, like the biggest picture, how do you break into that bubble? Do you have thoughts? On well, that? you you have to do what, you have to be willing to go into the lion's den. And not many people are willing to do that. I am, you know, I see Pete Buttigieg doing it all the time. Uh, I even see Chris Christie doing it, you know, going on, of course, he's running for office. So he's going, um, you know, to, on to speak to Democrats, what have you. And I think he's sort of like becoming part of no labels now. So we'll see where that goes. But um, I think, look, unless you go into the lion's den and be willing to get slaughtered, <laughs> as I was, then you're not going to reach those people. Uh, because even in this is we'll go in depth about Elon, you know, a little bit later, I'm sure. But even Elon admitted that he hadn't really watched me on CNN. Basically, his idea right. of who I was, was watching me on, you know, probably Fox or on conservative networks. And it's just sound bites of me where I'm a character or it's a caricature of Don Lemon. So but the interesting thing is, is that when you go in to try to reach those folks, they don't want to hear what you have to say. So, and if you hold up a mirror to them and you hold up facts to them, they're like, whoa, wait, wait, you're a liar. It's, it's what are news. you doing? Yeah, it's fake news. And so it's like, well, I don't, uh, maybe we're in an era now where it's just, maybe it's just not possible. I don't know. But I mean, what you're saying, think about what you're saying. 100% of the people who hear Donald Trump or listen just, just to conservative media, they love him. And then what did you say? It was like 70 70-ish, that's something in 70 yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if we could take off 30% I mean, of those other people, that's it, that's a win. We're in a much better situation, right? Like, you well, know what I, I mean? Well, yeah. What I'm just saying, though, is that the, their minds are made up. It's a fait accompli. Yeah. On, on the other end, you know, I have never seen so many people who are so overrepresented in polling. And everyone's like, oh, we need to hear from the MAGA people. What do they think? We hear from them all the time. Yeah. Like every single... Every single um, poll that we get, this is what MAGA thinks. Every single focus group that we do, this is every single, you know, group thing that we go to get opinions. It's always the MAGA people. They're overrepresented. So how much more do we need to know about them? It tells you exactly how they feel. Whatever Donald Trump wants, that's what they do. Do you ever watch, you ever watch those little skits at the top of the Jimmy Kimmel show where they'll ask mm. people, the questions I've seen about, the Jordan oh, Klepper versions of these. I don't watch. Well, okay, Jimmy well, well, there's those, yeah. Jim, but Jimmy Kimmel, but there, okay, there are different versions of these. But the ones I find the most effective is that they ask the people the same questions about Joe Biden. Like they'll use what Donald Trump has done, right? They'll say, yeah. "Can you believe you know um, Joe Biden paid off a porn star and hid it from his wife while she was pregnant?" Right. They'll go, "Oh my God, it's so horrible!" And then they'll you know ask a couple of those questions, and they go back and go, "I'm sorry, I got my research wrong." I meant Donald Trump on all those questions. And then they'll ask Donald the question using Donald Trump and they will make an excuse for him. And so I just don't think it's a winnable situation right now. I think those people have made up their minds. It's okay. very cult. -like. Um, so one more. Uh, it is one more on this. I'm, I'm also willing to go into the lion's den. And by the way, I know that there's some secret magas that listen to this. And so I'm, you can invite me. I'll go, I'll go and do same I'll go here fight with these. I'll go fight with these people. I'm happy to fight with a daily wire person or with a four poor Candace is going to need guests for her new show. Now that she's been canceled from the daily wire. <laughs> right. Uh, so I'm happy. Free to speech for me, but not for the Candace. Um, she did look, 50 I... set done in fairness. She did 57 anti-Semitic statements before Ben finally fired her. You know, he has, a very yeah. strict rule you know you can only do blood libel against jews like 82 <laughs> times before he says no more 
I will go in, but I find I, I, I don't mind going into the MAGA to whatever. I just don't like, you know, it gets personal sometimes. They start taking yeah. personal things like, oh, you, you know, you, you're gay. And you're like, yeah, what does yeah, that have yeah. to do with anything? You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. I, I've been dying to, I'm curious your take on this though. So then is there a line to that too, going to the lines then? So your old, your old colleague, Chris Cuomo went on Tucker and I, I watched it. I have to say, I don't recommend anybody go to Tucker's platform that's not comfortable because he literally promotes white nationalist um, uh, thought and and surrogates. Um, but I, I, it was a fascinating show. But I just, I was sitting there going, I don't know. It was different than you and the Elon thing because in the you and Elon thing, you're conducting the interview. And, and, and Chris went and did the interview with Tucker. I don't know. What, do you, what did you think about that? Well, I didn't, I, I didn't watch it. Um, I have just uh, a little bit texted with Tucker. Look, I don't have uh, anything against Tucker. I don't really know him that well. Um, well, the we, white nationalism, you know, I assume you don't like. Yes, yes. That, that I was getting to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't, you know, the things that come out of his mouth, I don't agree with. I find most of them reprehensible. I think the only communication that I've had with him is, um, you know, we got let go of the network on the same day. How odd that is. Sort of ha ha ha. What an interesting, you know, yeah. uh, how the world works. And um, he wanted me to come on the show. And I said, you know, let me figure out what I'm going to do. I don't mind going into the lion's den. Um, and what else? He said, uh, welcome to uh, X when I, you know, joined, um, when I agreed to be a distribution partner with him. And that was about it. Just a couple of times. Um, so, you know, I don't have anything against him. I don't agree with anything he says pretty much. But you thought about it? You thought about going on the show? Are you still thinking about I it? I did. I thought about going on the show. I actually thought about doing things with him, like, you know, sort of a, you, know, you remember, you know, the James Baldwin um, uh, series with, uh, oh my God, I'm having a senior moment. Who did he do it with William F. Buckley? Was it yes, William Buckley. Buckley? Yeah. With Buckley and Baldwin. And I was like, you know, that would be great for Tucker and I to do that if he could really do it from a place where we're trying to educate people instead of beating up on each other, where he's actually trying to learn um, about me and I'm trying to learn about him, which was my attitude going into the Elon thing. But um, I didn't watch the Tucker thing with Chris. Um, I just I feel that when you have these sort of let's say meetings of the mind or you have these sort of Titan clashes, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> That's very generous things- to Tucker. There are things you have to get off your chest first, because then you're not yeah. being honest with your audience and you're not being honest with yourself. And you're not being honest with his audience and him. You said this. I found this offensive. Or even if you just, you know, say, why would you say something like this? Why do you believe this? And I would expect the same thing from Tucker or whomever, even if Elon was interviewing me. I would expect that I would have to answer questions about what I've said, what I've done, what I've put out there. And if I can't defend myself in the moment, for something that came out of my own mouth, then who am I? What am I? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think I, I think it, and I think there has to be. It can't just be nicey nice. That was my. Th- issue. That's that's can't not do real. This, like oh, we're starting it, to learn. Was we, it nicey nice? nice? That was a little Josh. And I texted Chris about this. I'm not doing anything that's illegal. I was like, yeah, I wish you would have went at him a little more. And and I think his perspective was like. Well, I wanted to kind of draw it out and have a real conversation. And maybe that's just not my makeup. I don't know. I'm happy to go into the lion's den, but I'm going to roar. Okay. Like, same, I'm not going into same. the lion's den and doing this like, oh, well, well, we both have kids and that's nice. And it's like, yeah, I guess we yeah. both have kids, but you're the yeah. one that is, you know, doing apologia and promoting January 6th terrorists who attacked the Capitol and white, white replacement theory. And so I, I'm not, I'm not actually. We're not yeah, friends, the great actually. replacement theory, and yeah. you don't understand how the great replacement theory is really sort of a – it was a Jewish trope, and then you're using it now as for Democrats to say that the same thing are happening with like yeah. with what you call a Latino invasion or Hispanic invasion. Like it's like – but they can't answer for that. And and even what, with Elon about Duke University and DEI, again, we'll get into that. Yeah. There yeah, is let's no get into Elon. Actually, I have the clip. Let's just go straight. Okay. We, okay, we've go done enough, it. Tucker. Go for it. I've got the clip of you go talking to Elon about great. But I would, I would go it. on to Tucker. I think I would consider going on to Tucker, and you I would. would go into the Lions Den. I would go into the Lions Den. I think it's. I think we should all welcome that. Go on. So. I don't know. Actually, before we get to Elon, let's just ha- let's just ash that out. I just don't. I think Tucker might be too bad faith for it. I think you. I think he might be. Has demonstrated over time that he's not actually trying to have a genuine conversation. Um, and that would and that, that would have to be you know the agreement. I mean? That would have to be the agreement for with me and with him. And if it and if it turns out to not be that, then I think we would end it. But uh, Kara Swisher, as you know, has the same yeah. feeling as you do about that. We've Kara and I have this conversation all the time. We had it this summer 
when I was trying to figure it out. I said, people trying to get me to work with Tucker, where they want us to do events, but a whole, a whole host of things. And she said, she doesn't believe, she believes it's bad faith and he's too uh, toxic and that it would rub off on me. That's what she said. He would get more purchase out of it than I would. That's what she says. I agree with that. All right, let's listen to your, I don't know if I agree with that about the Elon convo. I might be on your side of it because of the nature of the conversation, but let's, uh, let's, let's just, since you mentioned it, let's listen to your exchange with him about the, about the uh, great replacement theory. The great replacement theory is a, a neo-Nazi trope. It's in the neo-Nazi manifesto. It's in the Turner Diaries. It's referenced by the Buffalo mass shooter uh, in his manifesto where 10 people, um, black people were murdered in Buffalo. His actual title of the Christchurch shooters manifesto 51 people in the Muslim mosque were murdered. 23 people uh, murdered in El Paso by a shooter who used the same language that you use in that manifesto when you say Hispanic invasion. Is that not? I didn't say an Hispanic invasion. And you tweeted, you quoted a tweet that said, that called it a Hispanic invasion. If I quote something, it doesn't mean I agree with anything, every image. <laughs> it's just something that I want, I think this is something worth people should uh, consider. Oh. I just think we should consider that we're being invaded. I'm just asking questions. Agree. I don't I'm actually just agree. Questions. Yeah, this yeah. was my. I thought it was a great interview. Uh, I think people should watch it. Uh, you know, obviously, people. You catch the clips on Twitter. I saw on X, whatever. I went back and rewatched the whole thing last night. And as a as a full hour, I do. I do. I kind of recommend it because you can see him getting more and more agitated over time. And like it was at that moment was the moment where I was the most wanting to yell through the computer. You know, when you're watching an interview, you're yelling through the computer. It's like, no, you're not. You're not just wanting people to consider it. You're promoting this. Like you have the biggest platform in the world, and and it it would be insane to think that like the Soulsberger publisher would would put something that he isn't sure is true that he just wants people to consider on the front page of the new york times and just be like consider we're being invaded Ar you know arthur salzberger's yeah. uh you know random random mo idea at 3 a.m when he's on ketamine like, like that's like not like you have an obligation and and he just doesn't seem to take that obligation that obligation seriously at all and was that your take he doesn't away, believe he has an obligation he doesn't yeah. he thinks that it, again it's this weird sort of hybrid wild wild west but maybe we have maybe we have some content moderation rules i don't know but um it was shocking to me that he you know in my estimation didn't think that he had any responsibility for to put for the truth any responsibility for facts any responsibility for hate speech any responsibility at all to sort of moderate the platform and as you said you talk about Soulsberger. I think in this day and age, and, and and back to the Tucker conversation, Tucker's a big figure, but Elon Musk is a bigger figure. He's really yeah. too big to ignore. He's too important to ignore. He's kind of, he's Henry Ford meets Rupert Murdoch, meets Howard Hughes, meets John Rockefeller. And he's done some extremely impressive uh, and innovative things, but he is also very, very, very dangerous. And I think, unfortunately for him, when presented with the evidence of what he has done and what he's doing, he it it's shocking to him because he can't explain it. He's not very good in person with people who are holding him accountable. He couldn't now look you in the getting, eye. He couldn't look he me really in the eye. Look he, you in the eye. No, and he became increasingly uh, uncomfortable and tense over the conversation because I was just Tim. The questions were not hard. I mean, come no. on. I could have no. really had I mean, some. Honestly, I had a couple. I had a couple notes for you. I was sitting there watching. I was like, "Come yeah. on, Don! Like, stick it in yeah. on all. Stick it to him." Sorry <laughs> about that. No pun yes. intended there. <laughs> <laughs> but that was. But that was. Before I get too far off, uh, you know, off track of what I'm, <laughs> the point I was making, that was intentional. I wanted very simple questions. I didn't want people to think I was attacking him. I wanted people to get to know about him and get to know about me. And the questions were. Where's it with a piece of paper? Um, why did you say this? Quote, these are your own words. I didn't say that. And you're like, yes. Well, I mean, he didn't quite do it that way. But I never said, yes, you did. Where's the evidence of this? Well, people in the, well, in the comment section will put it. And I was like, well, that's really not an answer. So my thing, the point I was making is that man to man, he's this very important, you know, gazillionaire. Um and who talks shit about me all the time. But yet, face to face, when I was this far from him as I am to this camera, he could not tell me how he felt. 
he about me. He couldn't defend himself. But afterwards, he goes on to Twitter and encourages his, you know, Minions. apologist to to attack me. He he is a keyboard warrior. He is an internet troll now, and he is afraid to confront me or talk to me man to man. He could have said whatever he wanted to say to me man to man instead of running away saying, oh, I have a meeting or going back behind his keyboard where he has keyboard courage and not courage in person to get people to attack me or to attack me myself or by saying, well, it turns out this isn't what I want. I'm taking my marbles and I'm going home. Wah! Right? Yeah. If you are if you are that strong of a person and you're that important, why not say, hey, man, I didn't agree with Don Lemon. But this is why I have him on the platform, because we need to hear all voices. In that interview, if he felt that way, it wasn't. I felt like he was attacking me. Okay, I, that's how I came away from it. But still, we need to have these conversations. That He doesn't have the EQ for that. And he doesn't like to be confronted. And I think it's very obvious. I'm shocked that so many people are defending him. No, and he doesn't want to have conversations. He doesn't. Right? Like, he doesn't. He wants to shit post, and he doesn't want people to criticize him. And and it's obvious that Twitter is is um, throttling criticisms of Elon and Tesla and all that. And he says he's for free speech, and it's like, well, you know, and it's obvious yeah. they're doing these things. And, uh, well, uh, yeah, and, and they're what do you call it? Shadow banning people and throttling, yeah. meaning they are suppressing content. And I mean, I just went on my thing. Like, look, I have no. Yeah, but I can never prove it, I'm sure, yeah. if I looked at their analytics and maybe they could. Ch- I'm sure they were throttling my stuff afterwards because yeah. he just probably didn't want to see it on his site. You know what I'm saying? And that, yeah. look, why did my you friend stay said, on? that's what I would do. Why, why did I stay, stay on? on? Yeah, why are you staying well, on? Well, I'm still on, too. I get people get mad at me, but I want to know why you're on. Well, I'm on now because, again, I want people to, I'm not afraid to be on it. Um, I don't have to promote it, you know, if, if I don't want to. You don't worry that it like lends your credibility to him or whatever that like, or that you're by being on, you're helping him maintain some influence over this town no, square. I've, and if we like put him into some MAGA ghetto of weirdos and freaks, then they wouldn't <laughs> have as much influence if everybody left. Like that would be the counter argument. Uh, well, listen, uh, people can feel that way if they want. The reason I went into it is because I believe it, you know, when you, uh, it's it's a big platform. It's and people are still on it, like you and like me. I, although I, I went back to it because of this, I would stopped um, posting or paying attention to it. Um, but I think it's huge. It is too big a and and too uh, too important of a platform to cede it to um, to extremists. And but it appears that's what it's becoming. And I think it's it, unless he changes course and unless he starts to listen to people like me and people like you and he starts to, you know, not throw out life stuff and to, you know, um, to really engage with people like us, then it's just going to become a platform just for extremists and election deniers and MAGA. And really it's just going to be, and people who just pat Elon Musk on the, on the back and, you know, go, Oh, you're so great. I love you so much. Um, so why am I on it? I'm on it, you know, one, because, I want people to know that I lived up to my side of the bargain and I'm still living up to it. Okay. And, um, you know, I also and, think and, people don't understand there. It's not as if it's not as black and white, you know, it's not like there's only people that are totally Elon minions or people that are repulsed by him. There are persuadable people out there and there are people, and it's important that they hear from other voices besides Elon's, you know? Well, I just yeah, I, it's true. Listen, I don't, again, I have nothing against Elon Musk except the stuff that he puts out there and which I asked him about, which I yeah. questioned him about, and he couldn't answer uh, for a lot of it and, or his answers were, you know, so, sort of nonsensical for much of it. And But he also had some very good answers to things and I understood him. And, you know, when he talked about why he used ketamine, okay, it's for depression. People do it. I've had drug-guided uh, therapy before. I have um, suffered from depression. Um, I am on SSRIs. So, look, those things I thought were interesting, and that was a meeting of the minds. And there were other things that we discussed and other, other uh, answers that he had that I thought were completely fine. And they may not have been what, you know, something that I agreed with, but, okay, I get it. That's You're conservative. You're libertarian or whatever it is you say you are, and that's how you feel. But um, I, I just think, Tim... When people say they want us on those platforms and they want to hear from people with diverse opinions, I think that they're in such echo chambers. And this is kind of goes back to, you know, cable news or whatever. 
they're in such echo chambers that when they actually hear the other side and they hear truth and facts, it is just so anathema to them that they're like, wait, what? And they automatically think that you're lying or you have an agenda just because. And that's not necessarily so. It's just that they're used to people feeding them the line all the time and agreeing with their world perspective and their point of view so much that when they hear another one, it just freaks them out. And I think that's what happened with Elon. All right. A few other just topics I just want to get your real quick thoughts on um, before I lose you. That things that I've thought like, I want to know what Don Lemon thinks about this. What You're not going to lose me unless you're running out of time. It's fine. Uh, the discourse around, um, not the discourse, the data around the fact that Joe Biden and, and Democrats are losing altitude with black voters. Um, I think there was a lot of black, uh, that, that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is pulling pretty well with black voters. Younger black voters are upset about that. Like, what do you attribute that to? I guess I won't put what, what do you, what do you attribute it to? Well, um, I am, what do I attribute that to? I attribute it to that people feel that again, that they're not being heard. They feel that people, and I'm speaking in general, not just for Joe Biden and I'll get more specific in, yeah. in a second that people say things when they are, um, you know, running for office or they go into, you know, a black diner or, whatever restaurant when they're running for office. And then I never really hear from you again. I don't, I'm not saying that's the case with Joe Biden or Kamala Harris, because I actually think that they're doing um, things that do affect people of color and do help people of color, especially if you look at, you know, um, uh, just household income and wealth, uh, the wealth inequality in this country. And it's usually minorities, especially people of color who are at the bottom. So I think they're helping yeah. with that when it comes to student loans, et cetera. Um, but I just think that when you're in office and you know it's a limited amount of time, um, especially, you know, even like President Obama, when you say, you know, I'm not the president of black America, I'm not the president of white America, I'm the president of America. That's true. That is true. But you have to understand that not everyone has had a fair shake in America. And if you are in a position to help those in a very limited amount of time to help the people who are the underserved communities in this country, time is running out. Time's a wasting. Then you need to do it and not, you know, try to be so well. I'm not present black American, white America, Hispanic America, gay America, straight America. Yes. But in that America, you know what's up. And especially if you are a Democrat and you're progressive, you know what's up when it comes to underserved communities. So I really do think that's it. And I also think that the Democrats, just quite frankly, you know, the, the economy's doing, we're doing well. This, yeah. We have the best economy in the world. Their messaging is just not good. They're not good at politicking. Republicans yeah. are very good at, at, at you know, picking slogans and, and messaging and politicking. Look at, they play the long game. Look at what happened with Roe, right? Look at what happened with the Supreme Court. If Democrats would just do that and not be so afraid of criticism and, and not be afraid, uh, not allow their detractors and their opponents to define them. And that happened a lot for me when I was working in news, broadcast and cable. Oh, my gosh. People are going to think that we are uh, conservative. People are going to um, are liberal. People are going to. Who gives a fuck? As long as you're doing the right thing, why do you care what your enemy or with someone who doesn't like you? Why do you care what they say about you? Why do you care what someone who is never going to write something or say something in the media kindly about you or in your favor, even if you're doing a good job? Why do you care about what they think and say? Just do you. So I wish Democrats, who I think at the moment is the only party who's really looking out for the country. I'm not saying they're doing everything right. But if you look at conservatives, look at what's happening with the House with Kevin McCarthy and, you know, and, and, and you know, Johnson, they're trying to oust him. They're in chaos and they're actually not trying to help people. So Democrats continue on trying to keep democracy intact. Forget about what your opponents are thinking and saying about you and just do your thing. Have some guts like Republicans do. Go in, go hard. And just get it done. You're only in office for a limited amount of time and you're only in office at the will of the people and the will of, and the people can vote you out at any moment. So while you're there, don't waste it. I totally agree with that. I want to throw one other thing because it's kind of across sex, your identities on this question. Some people would say, I want to be careful about how I say this, but I, I just, but I, I think it's important conversation to have. I, what I'm not saying is that like the black community is more disproportionately homophobic or whatever, but, but some people I think point out that D Donald Trump is doing better with young black men who maybe have less educational attainment, 
who don't really love kind of the feminization, the LGBTization of culture. They think that the Democratic mm-hmm. Party, you know, doesn't really represent them as well. Um, what do you think about kind of the cult? Do you think that there's a cultural element to this that Donald Trump is kind of appealing to younger black men on that on those grounds or or not really? Okay. Well, one is, uh, you know, I would say stay tuned to the Don Lemon show for Monday because I I spoke to D.L. Hughley and we talked all all about this and he has a very good answer. His answer is better than mine. Okay. Uh, what do I think about that? I think there is some truth to what you're saying. This was saying. an unintentional promo, by the way. And I love I know I get, And I've been trying to get D.L. Hewley on, too. So great. <laughs> I, I'm excited to watch that. You said D.L. is great. Um, and he, you know, he sort of relates it to um, when he, especially about black men being attracted to Donald Trump and the MAGA movement. He said, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like rap music. You know, all that shit. He goes, the, the airplanes and the money you see in the rap videos, he says rap videos, you know, it's not real. And it's the same thing for the MAGA people. It's the same thing for Donald Trump. It's all a facade. It's all a lie and it's fake. So I think that sort of entertainment, that's just the entertainment aspect of it. You yeah. know, he stands up for people. He's a badass. He's got a lot of money. He's got a plane. He's got gold, whatever. That, that's appealing to a certain uh, demographic with, uh, of black men. Uh, but I also think, that, honestly, there are black conservatives. You know, I think black people are conservative socially, at least where I you know, grew up in Louisiana. And most black people are from the South. Most the majority of African-Americans live in the South. The South is very red. They're very, you know, church going and and religious. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, but I really don't think that there is a big enough uh, contingent of African-American men or black men that's going to change anything in the polling. Um, so, you know, I think the, the, this polling about losing, you know, black men to MAGA, I think that's sort of that's overstated. Um, But I do think it's enough of a concern that Democrats should be worried about it and why they're not appealing to those people. Part of it is just, as I said, just messaging. And that's just, you know, it's great to to be rich and do all those things. That's why they appeal to MAGA. But I think conservatives, in some sense, do appeal to the conservative nature of African-Americans socially. And I think that Democrats should take it, you know. I do think so, too. This is something I say, like, if you look at polls. By the way, like twenty percent of Democrats is going down. Maybe it's like in the teens now are, are like pro life religious. A lot of them are, mm-hmm. are black folks, and like they do not exist in media, right? Like you cannot right. find like, like that person does not exist in the media at all. And it's like a fifth of the Democratic Party. So I, I do think that there are ways that Democrats could speak to them. Okay, uh, we're out of time. I, well, I have to finish though. Louisiana. <laughs> also, I have a book. I have a book on religion coming out, and I explain some of that stuff too. Oh, really? What is <laughs> another, it? What is, what's it going to be? It's called um, I Once Was Lost, My Search for God in America. It comes out. It was going to come out after the election, and I think I actually did find him. I'm excited. Well, we're going to have to do that again next year. We can do all God. <laughs> we're just going to do God and Louisiana and gay stuff the next time, just sort of the intersection. But, I, but if we leave, there's God. No, no, I got it. God's gaze and gumbo. Go on. God's gaze and gumbo. Boom. <laughs> 2025. Hopefully we still have a democracy then. You can be back. We can do a whole episode on that. Um, all right. But I have to. we have to leave. So Kim Mulkey. People don't know. She's the coach of the LSU uh, women's basketball team. She went on a rant this week. There's apparently a Washington Post article coming out about her. And I want to know if you, you struggle with this like me. Because in some ways, she's like a gay icon. She's fabulous. Her outfits, you know, like she's out there playing. And, and, and she's coaching these young black women. And I was watching this press conference. And it's like Flange Johnson and, and Angel Reese are like playing their singles for her and they seem to be having a good time. So that's the one side of Kim Mulkey that, that, that makes me, and I know this kind of woman in Louisiana, you know, sort of a older culturally conservative woman, but it's still really in touch, but still like likes gays and black, you know what I mean? Just not, she doesn't seem right. to me like she's like a hateful person. On the other hand, it seems like she was pretty mean to Brittany Griner. I don't know what's going to come out in this story. Seems like, seems like she obviously has some, also some demons, I don't know. Kim Mulkey. I, I need to know what Don Lemon thinks about Kim Mulkey. Well, I don't know what's going to come out in the story, but she's threatening to sue the Washington Post, right? Yeah. And so um, I just remember, and I'm sure you can relate, when I, you know, I came out, God, more than a decade ago, I think the only people who were out in media were Rachel Maddow and Thomas Roberts. And um, at least, you know, people who were yeah. Uh, who people knew are on television. You beat Anderson? I need to have my gay timeline going. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, not, not long, not by yeah. much, but uh, I think like a year or so. Yeah. Um, so I think, 
you know, it, it, they come from that era, as you said, and I'm not making an excuses because no, no. people told me, you know, I wouldn't do it. You're going to be known as the gay anchor. People don't need to know about your sexuality and blah, 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 right. blah, blah. So there was a time when I understood why people were saying that, even though I, that wasn't my belief. And finally, I just said, as a journalist, I'll get back to Kim in sports, whatever. Yeah, no, please. I want to hear about that. As, as a journalist, I have to have the same standards that for myself that I have for people. So I can't, ex I can't expect to question people and have them come on and say, you need to be transparent. You need to tell me the truth about what you're doing and what you're saying, whatever, when I was hiding something. Now, look, people can feel the way that they feel. You know, I think that if you are a, a, a person who uh, has a platform now and you're not out, then you're not doing it right. I mean, why are you afraid and why are you hiding? And I know people say it's nobody's business, but I think there's deception and silence. Okay. No, you're totally, is it uh, by far the best decision I ever made for my ever psychology? Made in, in I say my that life. to anybody that ever asked me. Best decision yeah. I ever made. Yeah. And then my husband and my people get like, what about your kid? And I'm like, well, my kid happened because I did that thing first. Because right? Like that. all yeah. the good stuff that happened for me came from that yeah. decision. So totally people go through all these mental gymnastics in their head. And they're like, why do people need to know? And I'm like, well, yeah. if someone said, do you have kids? Do so you go, well, that's none of your business. Or someone yeah. says, do you have a wife? No, that's none of your business. I said, well, then the only reason you're hiding it is because you think there's wrong or it's going to hurt you in some way. Amen. And so anyways, so uh, I can understand maybe years ago getting that, you know, advice from uh, co from the coach. Uh, and I can understand why she said it. But in this day and age, and especially in sports, just, it's a whole just for context, she was telling Brittany Griner, who, you know, was not to, come uh, out. Not, not to come out when they, when she was coaching her at Baylor, I guess. Or not to talk about her sexuality or what have you. It. Yeah. 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 So, um, look, again, I don't know the specifics behind what they're going to write, so I'll give her a little leeway right now. But um, I think in this day and age, to tell someone not to come out and not to talk about their sexuality is doing an injustice, not only to the world, which can benefit from that, but especially to the person who is gay or, you know, lesbian or bisexual or what have you. I think it, it is, it doesn't help them and can ultimately delete to some really bad things by suppressing who and what they are. Amen. I agree with that. I I don't know what will happen. I hope for the for the young women, for my for Angel and Flage, I hope that those LSU Tigers keep on winning and we'll we'll see what happens with the Washington Post yeah, story. And if you have a name like Flange, Flange, Flange just man, be fabulous. I love her. Just be you. I, I know, love right? Her. Oh, she's my favorite. <laughs> okay. Uh, John Lemon, thanks so much. Go Tigers. Fellow Louisiana. Tigers. I'm not really Louisiana and I'm adopted. But you're uh, you're are you native? You're native? Where are you born? Who, Baton Rouge? Who that? Who that? I was born in Baton born at born at Baton Rouge General Hospital. Baton Rouge General Hospital. Shout out to yeah. BR General and I uh, hope we can we'll do this next year god's gaze and gumbo thank you don lemon for coming on the bulwark podcast we'll talk to you soon